Yes, so thank you, uh, Oriol, thank you, Philippe, thank you, Mario, and welcome to our speakers, to the last panel of, of today, Marcus and uh, Marcus Pruch and Aurora Ailinkai. The last uh, panel of today uh, will be on the European Memory Initiative and Development in 2021. Uh, just uh, two words on our speakers. Uh, Marcus Pruch is a senior investigator and administrator at the European Parliament, responsible for culture and education policies, and associate uh, professor of modern and contemporary history at Heidelberg University in Germany. He has a, a PhD from the European University Institute in Florence, and uh, his main fields of interest are European political and constitutional history, political theory and philosophy, comparative research on democracy and dictatorship, memory and identity studies. So uh, his presentation uh, will uh, um, focus on the European memory initiative and developments in 2021, in particular legal initiatives, but also um, will include some reflections on existing challenges for European memory uh, in view of Black Lives Matter, for instance, renationalization tendencies in Eastern uh, Europe and the legal persecution of memorial in Russia. Um, so as far as uh, our second speaker is concerned, uh, Aurora Arlinkai, uh, she's the executive director of the Council of Europe uh, Observatory on History Teaching in Europe. She has a PhD in edu Educational Sciences at the University of Strasbourg. She has a master's degree in political sciences and European studies at Sorbonne University in Paris. And uh, her presentation will be focused on the raison d'être of the Observatory on History Teaching in Europe and uh, will include a presentation of this new body of the Council of Europe. Uh, so I let the floor to the first speaker, Marcus, and then to uh, Aurora. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Deborah, for your kind words of introduction and, and a big thank you to the organizers of today's conference for having me again. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to talk about how I see recent developments um, of memory policies in Europe, but also beyond, since after all, also Europe is not isolated from the rest of the world. And there are clear interaction also in terms of memory policies uh, in a, at a global scale. If you allow, I will try to share my screen with you. So let's see whether this works. I hope you can see my PowerPoint. Yes, you can see. Oh, super. So what I had intended to do is to, to start with a few words of well, introduction reflection on recent developments, then really try to, to categorize perhaps those developments. So what are what I consider key trends of memory politics? And here I consciously use the term politics rather than policies in Europe, but also beyond. Um, before dealing briefly with the actions or rather reactions of the European Union and the European Parliament in particular, before um, finishing with um, a short outlook, a, a more personal one. But let me start with what I called an introduction and um, maybe with a question. Namely, do we see what might be called a repoliticization of history and a return of what we might call politics of the past, meaning that the past, that history and the memory thereof is consciously used for political purposes. And um, one could argue that there are certain developments that really well seem to corroborate this claim. If we are thinking about tendencies in Russia, for example, where, I mean, nostalgia about the Stalinist past has been ever present, but where more recently also the state authorities are consciously trying to revise history, including by means of attacking a Memorial International, one of the, well, best established organizations in the world dealing with totalitarian pasts, but 
uh, not to forget the Black Lives Matter movement, which has become a global movement. The question how intrinsic also structural and systemic racism is in Western societies. But one could argue that even in countries like Germany, which for long has been considered as, as a prime example how people should deal with history in a critical manner, you see tendencies of a revisionist nature more recently. For example, the idea that the Federal Republic had never existed and that there is a direct link between the former um, German Empire um, and which would have never ended. So you, you see clearly that even in, in Germany, there are tendencies that ask for a revision, at least of the way how history is dealt with. So do we really see such a return of politics of the past? Well, I would argue maybe it's more kind of, it's becoming more active, it's becoming more vocal, but it has always been there. It's nothing that has ever, be, has ever been away. And this is also simply true to the fact that historical memory is not the same as historical truth. That's, that's something we should always keep in mind. So meaning it was always up for contestation. It's an issue of subjectivity and value judgments in the end. Um, in history and memory thereof has always also a functional role, which means there is this ever-present like the openness to politicization of history, meaning politicians will always be tempted to somehow use or even abuse history for particular purposes, even if they might be of a very noble kind. Having said that, I just might want to repeat also for myself and for all of us also why history has become so ever present, especially at national level. Well, simply because historical memory is always intrinsically correlated also with nation and state building. And it is characterized also by very specific and sometimes selective references to the past, um, which makes for a broader public impact of such memory, um, but also helps to essentialize and simplify history in a way that you really manage to, to approach a broader audience than just trained historians. But automatically by doing that, there is this imminent tendency to always elevate national history and sometimes also to create myths about it. Having said that, let me turn now what I consider recent developments in terms of memory policies in Europe, but also beyond, as I said. And here I could identify a few trends, so to say. The first is that I see in, in recent years, and in particular also 2021, that uh, the issues of inequality and systemic racism have become pro problematized in a way maybe more intensively than, than before. And here um, I can mention again what, what I already did before, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but we can also see that those new dealing with inequality and racism has sometimes led to a, a very confrontational uh, status of history. And I quote here the example of the United States, where you see that the 69 project, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, this was a New York Times project trying to argue that actually the founding moment of the United States of America is not so much 1776, as we all assume, but rather 1619, the moment when the first slaves were brought to the North American continent. But this um, drive for a more critical dealing with racism in the United States was almost immediately countered during the Trump administration still by the so-called 1776 commission, a very official commission, that the main task of which was actually to show, no, that's not true. The true founding moment is still 1776. And there is nothing like systemic racism in the United States. And you can see the political nature of this conflict by the fact that the 1776 commission was abandoned on 20th January um, this year, the very moment that uh, 
Joe Biden, the new president, assumed office. So on the very first day in office, he abandoned that commission, which shows also the, well, genuinely political character also of dealings with history. A certain trend that I can see is that colonial and post-colonial controversies are resurfacing. And here I'm just quoting one example, a recent one, France and the Algerian War. Um, the comments um, by President Macron, for example, um, acknowledging also that um, the dealings with the Harkis, um, the supporters of the French government during that war, that more attention needs to be paid to them, but also sending a message to Algeria and saying that the colonial past cannot be an excuse for um, political failings in the present of those states, which created, of course, an outcry on the Algerian side, saying that France has not yet overcome its colonial past and so forth. So we see also here, um, maybe again, strong controversies around the issue of colonialism. A third trend um, I, I have witnessed uh, recently is the attempt to reform history education and in particular history curricula um, in, in a neo-national, neo-nationalistic way. So again, to try to interpret history in a very national and nationalistic manner and trying rather to, to forget about European or global dimensions. And here I'm quoting just the example of Poland, where um, the ambition is to rewrite the history curriculum and to put a stronger focus on a more nation and religion centric history teaching again, than is currently the case. Fourthly, what I see also, and this is maybe the most troubling um, development is the conscious suppression also of critical dealings with troubled pasts. And here Russia is certainly a key example with the harassment of uh, Memorial International. So the attempt really to try to rewrite history by getting rid of organizations that, that are attempting to critically deal with those histories and especially totalitarian pasts. Of course, you could add maybe more developments. This is more like what I consider the main developments, but I hope they provide you with an idea of where I see that currently most of the memory fights are currently ongoing. What are the actions or rather reactions of the European Union um, to those developments? Well, in that sense, again, it's maybe good to recapitulate what are the the imperatives, so to say, of European memory policies. I think we, we are all not, not so naive to believe that, of course, memory policies are just done for the sake of trying to get a better understanding of the past. But it's also about generating political legitimacy for the European Union and the European project. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think it's worthwhile also just to keep that in mind. It's about fostering something like European identity in this context and as you are also aware there are traditional reference points uh, in that context european cultural heritage the second world war and the european integration process um, as such as we just heard celebrating also like crucial documents um, in that european integration process and then we have the more specific reference points since the 1990s which still play a predominant role um, also in the new program, as we heard this morning, namely the Holocaust and more generally 20th century totalitarianisms in the plural. The activities of the EU and the European Parliament in particular have traditionally been focused on the one hand on awareness raising political activities and initiatives. So supporting the Holocaust Remembrance Day becoming established throughout Europe. Uh, establishing the European Day of Remembrance for victims of Stalinism and Nazism, the 23rd of August, but also uh, different resolutions. The latest big one being in 2019 at the occasion of the 80th anniversary of the beginning of the Second World War, the EP resolution on the importance of European remembrance for the future of Europe. So here also clearly linking that dealing with the past is crucial, not just for the present, but also for the future 
of our continent and the European Union in particular. The, um, a very important role plays the, the previous Europe for Citizens program that is now luckily continued in form of the SERF program. Um, but you can also see the, the advocacy of the European Parliament and the European institutions in general for the European Year of Cultural Heritage as a sign how important history and the memory thereof is at European level. And of course, I should mention the establishment and the further development of the House of European History, including the Jean Monnet House, um, which is kindly hosting also today's event. But having said that, it's important to keep in mind that maybe what appears as a more or less coherent memory policy and strategy of the European Union and the European Parliament um, is not always like that and that there are also failed initiatives in the past. And I mentioned one that in 2013, there was the attempt to go for a parliament resolution on historical memory and culture and education in the European Union, so to say, to agree on how we should deal with history in the fields of culture and education. And this initiative already failed at committee stage, simply due to the lack of any cross-party agreement and missing majorities for any possible solution. So it shows that still history continues to be a very contested thing, even at the level of the European Union. What are now current EP initiatives and actions to give you an idea what is really currently ongoing? Um, research has been commissioned on European memory and adequate ways of dealing with troubled past at supranational level by the European Parliament. Why to prepare a planned 2022 own initiative report on European historical consciousness. So the attempt one could argue to try again almost 10 years after that failed initiative, which I mentioned, um, whether something like a European uh, policy statement on historical consciousness can be established at the EP level. At the same time, there is a clear public reputation of misrepresentations of European and national histories and the defense of independent historical research and the critical collective memory. I mentioned two examples here. There was a letter exchange between the chair of the cult committee in this case and the Polish minister of education on the planned uh, curricular reform in Poland, um, in which also the European Parliament asked for clarification. What does it mean? Um, like um, going back to a more nationalistic history, does it mean what role does Europe still play? And, and very recently, the public reputation in an open letter uh, to the Russian authorities uh, criticizing the legal prosecution of Memorial International, which is currently undergoing and published soon. So these are like some of the, the actions and initiatives that are currently ongoing at that level. That brings me to, to the, my last slide, to an outlook. How do I see a European memory politics and especially policies developing in the future? Well, there will be this ever-present gulf between history on the one hand and politics on the other, which is always hard to bridge in the sense of that while history is in the end about trying to find evidence, politics is in the end also about power. And um, there will always be this contestation also at European level. What I still see is a bit of a discrepancy between aspiration and reality in the sense of like what, what policy documents, but also the programs that are in place are actually asking and the reality we are facing every day in Europe, where we see that history is very actively used and abused for very concrete political purposes, especially by some member states, that we are still facing the fact that we, there is not one single memory frame in Europe, but rather there are different competing memory frames where different elements play a different role for different nations in, in Europe. And that, of course, our remembrance is still characterized also by teleology, usually the idea that we are aiming for something better than the past was, <laughs> um, and also to a degree to, of reductionism in the sense of we try to to reduce our historical memory to very specific moments, very specific interpretations and elements. And 
there is the ever-present discrepancy between the European and the national level, which is still a bit unresolved, and which is also corroborated by misreadings of what European historical memory should be, which some still seem to see, oh, it's like one memory everyone should share, while it's really more about trying to, to deal with the past in a common way, but also a misreading of European citizenship, which is not about creating citizens that think the, in, a, in a very similar or even the same way, but rather creating critical Europeans. Which is why, and this is my Zetterum Zensio, for which I have argued for many years, I still see the need to move from a remembrance culture that is focused on what to remember and how to remember, rather as a first step to a culture of remembering, to develop tools and fora that we can exchange critically about the past and that our own ideas get confronted with those of others. And I would say that today's um, meeting is a very good example for doing exactly that, that we meet, that we share experiences, share views, and those shared views, this multi-perspectivity, to use Constance's term from the beginning, allows us also to see things through a European lens. I think I will stop here. I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm glad to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, many thanks to, to Marcus Bruch for uh, his presentation. I think we can go on with uh, our second speaker's uh, presentation and uh, at, uh, at the end of the, of the panel to, to take questions to, uh, to both of them. So Aurora, uh, please. Uh... Yes. Yeah. Yes, so um, good day everybody and I apologize in advance for the quality of the sound. I might cut the camera because it cuts already, I cut it already two times uh, since I uh, managed to connect. So I have some technical issues uh, and I'm on my mobile phones and we don't have a, a Wi-Fi in the office in the Council of Europe. So I let a bit the camera so we see me now, but I will cut it so it's much easier for me to count on the good connection, uh, if you don't mind. So, um, okay. Now, um, um, thank you so much uh, to Marty for this um, invitation. Uh, I am the, the executive director of the newly established Observatory on History Teaching in Europe, uh, in the Council of Europe. And um, um, I'm very happy to be with you today, knowing that, um, of course, uh, as far as I could follow uh, in the discussion, um, there is a focus uh, very much on the content, uh, on the work that is being done. And, and being here for the first time and uh, being invited to introduce to you the Observatory on History Teaching in Europe, I will uh, have a short presentation that will not um, bring you so much information uh, on the content of the work of the Observatory. And this is for the simple reason that we started um, uh, to work um, on the activities, on the, on the program of the observatory um, two months ago, more or less. Yes, because we spent uh, the the, uh, the months since uh, the observatory was established on building the structure uh, of the observatory. So the observatory on history teaching in Europe is a newly established, as I said, body in the Council of Europe, fully part of the Council of Europe, but established as an, a partial um, agreement, um, uh, enlarged partial agreement of the Council of Europe. And this is for those that don't know this, it's a um, form of cooperation that uh, allows member states of the Council of Europe to be part of uh, such uh, a cooperation initiatives or not. And being in large partial agreement, it's open to any other country in the world. It could be uh, a European country or from another continent, but that's for the um, prospects that we have for the observatory, something that hopefully will be uh, very interesting uh, to, to look at in the future. 
we focus now on the member states of the observatory and we have 17 of the Council of Europe member states already part of the observatory. This initiative was launched during the French presidency of the Committee of Ministers in the Council of Europe, and it was adopted during the Greek presidency and uh, established in November 2020. So I was appointed myself in April this year, and we started to function with the, um, the governing board, the scientific advisory council, the selection of experts. Uh, uh, um, so the, the group of experts working also on, uh, on the uh, activities of the observatory very recently, as I said. Um, Deborah, you mentioned uh, raison d'etre um, uh, of the observatory at the beginning when we introduced the topic, and I'm really sorry I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation, but this is again the connection issues. And um, this um, makes me um, just uh, go back to the previous presentation, because um, Listening to um, to the previous uh, speaker, um, I think that um, many things were mentioned uh, in in his presentation, and um, notably the the politician will always use and abuse history. Um, but I will go into the main um, uh, let's say reason why we established this observatory, and it's it's really looking at at the, the present day, uh, these times of increased challenge, uh, challenges to democracy, and, and the fact that these challenges are very often connected to the manipulation of history or the distortion of history. And, and we considered in the Council of Europe, a human rights organization, that such an observatory is vital in these uh, 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 times. So, um, the uh, main activity of the observatory will be to um, to uh, to have a, to make a picture of the situation of teaching uh, uh, history of the state of teaching history in the member states, and and this is uh, as the president of the board is always underlying a very modest objective, uh, and we start with a very modest objective really to show um, uh, through concrete data what's the state of art when it comes to history teaching, because many reports show that there is a direct link between teaching history and the way history is taught and the state of democracy. And basically it's mainly linked to how uh, uh, the new generation, how the pupils, the students in school are prepared to be citizens in uh, societies and how they are prepared to preserve and to promote democracy. Uh, history education having a very important role in this. And, and, and we noticed that apart the um, um, uh, actors and stakeholders that are very much, I mean, that are working in the field and are very familiar with the, um, um, I mean, uh, it's just basically the specialized public, you know, scholars, insider of networks, like, you know, uh, some of them that you may uh, know, like Euroclio or, or other of this uh, type. So the state of play is poorly known uh, by the majority of the European society. And for this reason, uh, the observatory has been mandated to collect all relevant information um, on the whole chain of teaching from the education establishment and the content of the curricula, the didactics, the status of textbooks and of the schools themselves, uh, the teaching and recruitment of teachers, um, so the whole education system and down to the margin of maneuver left to the teachers on their pedagogy and teaching material that they use uh, and methods. Uh, and to this, of course, also the, the, the non-formal education. So we will have what we call the regular reports. And the first one is planned to be ready at, um, by the end of 2023. And, uh, and these reports uh, will be used, uh, the results of these reports will be a very good source of information and will be used by uh, the networks of institution, organization, uh, um, the specialized public, the, the, the experts, the professionals uh, uh, in the field of history education for uh, further action. Uh, in addition to the regular reports that is the main, is the main activity of the observatory, we also uh, produce what we call thematic reports. And the thematic reports are um, um, 
uh, are produced uh, uh, on specific topics that are uh, um, uh, proposed by the Scientific Advisory Council and uh, approved by the Governing Board. And the first thematic report will be on pandemics and natural disasters reflected as reflected in history teaching. So that would be a first report due to uh, be published uh, by the end of 2022, next year. And, and for the thematic uh, reports, um, we will also, um, in a way, uh, uh, test the methodology uh, that uh, it's used for the for gathering the data and analyzing the data for the regular reports. So um, the the work of the observatory is basically there to support what the Council of Europe does uh, in the intergovernmental project uh, on history education. And this is the project that exists in the Council of Europe for a long while. We started to work in the Council of Europe on this topic in uh, uh, first with basically the, the adoption of the Cultural Convention in uh, 1954. Uh, but there were a set of projects and programs in the Council of Europe that focused on history uh, education and uh, the latest uh, project that uh, is uh, now uh, implemented uh, by the education department in the Council of Europe is very much uh, of course um, um, uh, uh, corresponding also to the uh, objectives that we have with the observatory on history teaching. Uh, our first uh, public uh, event uh, took place last week. Uh, it was um, a promotional exercise, uh, first of all. So we planned to uh, speak about the um, about the um, observatory to the public to make it known to um, to bring um, uh, around the table uh, possible uh, partners. Um, I see that my camera is moving, but OK, now it's working. So uh, possible partners. And, and here is where we met with the Jean Monnet House and, and, and we launched formally what we call a cooperation platform or a cooperation hub. So the idea is that at least once per year that we organize a big forum in which all the institutions, organizations, intergovernmental and non-governmental institution will uh, have a forum of discussion um, in which uh, the state of history teaching will be discussed, but also the most burning uh, topics that are related to it and, and the impact uh, 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 history education can have, uh, of course, uh, um, in, um, in our societies. Um, I, I will stop here. And, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. And I, I promise that in the next meeting, uh, there will be much more to say about the observatory because I wanted to be brief and just introduce you to the observatory. But next year, we will have more to say in terms of content of the work, uh, the results of the work of the observatory, and especially also the content of these reports that, um, that we uh, just um, uh, launched uh, some weeks ago. Thank you very much. And thank you again, uh, uh, Marty, for the invitation and sorry for the connection problems. You're welcome. <laughs> Many thanks for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so I open the floor uh, if uh, someone uh, of the attendees uh, <coughs> sorry, have a, a question for one or, or, or both the, the speakers. You can simply uh, speak um, or write in the, in the chats. Well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll jump in first, like last time, just because then I think last time it had a good effect that then there were more, more questions after. Uh, well, thank you very much to, to both, uh, Marcus and, and uh, Aurora. It was, it was just great, as we expected. Uh, we're not, of course, mistaken in, in, in asking you both to, to, to present uh, extremely interesting topics. Uh, you gave like a really, really broad overview, and that's that's just what we needed. This this kind of like also refreshing perspective, as I as I said at the beginning, after the 
dryness maybe but also important of course of the of the of the facts and figures and and, and specs that we saw uh more clearly in the first uh session that that is precisely the, the goal of, of this meeting to to reunite re reunite both dimensions in one uh, single event uh just uh one um, i have one specific concern in general in general not not just today but it's it's about the geographical scope of our actions in general, you know. So uh, uh, there was a question about that earlier on. I think it was with regards to thing we all asked about the the scope of the the program of the surf program of the commission, asking if non EU member states were eligible. Well, it goes in that direction. My question, I think, unfortunately, that that uh, the geographical scope of the different um, initiatives is still very uneven. I mean, of course, because of the institutional, uh, you know, membership, and it could could not be otherwise. But at the same time, we are in need of 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 doing uh, of sending a message that is is valid for all the continent, you know, regardless of membership of institutional arrangements, etc. So uh, maybe I mean it can be also a question to Marcus, but more specifically in, in more practical terms, also to Aurora, uh, I would like to know how she sees the the, the precisely the potential for complementarities in this respect between the Council of Europe and the EU institutions. Uh, and I'm just going to just bring in like a, an element that we haven't discussed until now. Maybe I was saving it for the conclusions, but I'll say it now, is that uh, I think it, it, we have one uh, piece of good news is that uh, in the last days, the European Parliament uh, Bureau approved uh, a new um, distinction for uh, European democracy sites. And luckily, uh, in that direction, it is not just for uh, EU member states, but also for uh, states that belong to to the neighborhood policy, the EU neighborhood policy. So I think it's 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 one step in that direction. Maybe not enough. Maybe we need much more. But I would like to know what you how you see this this question, both in let's say conceptual and practical terms. Thank you. Um, I, I can just mention something briefly, again, with apologies, because I didn't follow the whole discussion, but, but we did um, look um, into different initiatives before even we had uh, our annual conference last uh, week. Uh, and and um, especially with the EU, when it comes to the European Parliament or with, with the European Commission, of course, we consider um, uh, European Union as a very important partner. Uh, and that's also um, illustrated in, uh, in our status uh, of the observatory where the EU and UNESCO are mentioned uh, specifically, but other international organizations as well, intergovernmental organization that can either cooperate directly with the observatory requesting uh, uh, observer status or uh, to be member or through um, concrete cooperation uh, in the activities that are um, developed by the observatory. Um, now, um, Definitely the interest of the Observatory of History Teaching is to have as many partners uh, as possible uh, when it comes to the dissemination of the results of the reports, but also on the follow-up actions uh, when the reports will be ready. So if for the reports we have quite a um, specific methodology with different layers that will ensure um, objectivity, uh, to gather the data and analyze the data from the member states, uh, transparency, of course, but but with the Scientific Advisory Council, which is an independent body uh, uh, overseeing the work of the observatory, also to have the uh, academic uh, rigor, academic support and, and, and methodological, uh, of course, uh, quality of the works. Uh, so at this level, um, I think that there is still a um, place for um, cooperation because in the methodology, when data for the reports are gathered uh, by the different experts, there might be 
different approaches uh, proposed by external partners, or simply uh, we may need to have partnership with um, uh, structures that uh, are uh, directly working with the student associ association or parents association, because different approaches and point of view should be also be reflected in this uh, in these reports. So. Um, this is um, a more a specific type of cooperation that I wouldn't go into discussing now because it demands uh, a separate discussion with the with the, our uh, scientific advisory council, the experts, etc. But for the cooperation uh, that is needed uh, uh, on the results of the reports and the follow up to this uh, result, dissemination of the reports, and any action that uh, should be taken afterwards, uh, as I mentioned before, we launched this uh, um, informal. Um, uh, platform for cooperation that we want to develop more next year. And uh, Vice uh, President Skinas of the Commission was present in our annual conference last week, and, and he kindly announced uh, political support from the European Commission uh, for the works of the observatory, including a financial support that is foreseen already in the Erasmus uh, Plus project. So uh, we now uh, explore this, how this can be done in such a way that all all the exist existing initiatives, because there are so many, um, are also supported by the Commission and being already either under development or proposed for financing next year or in the next years. So we want to first of all avoid any overlap uh, with the, with what exists already, but build really on the actions that are complementary to the observatory's work and can combine this intergovernmental. Uh, uh, approach that we have in the Council of Europe with the observatory and the non-governmental also actions that we can see in different projects or different partnerships between academia, between uh, museums, between uh, um, any non-governmental organization that work uh, that works on um, uh, on history education. So uh, just to summarize, uh, Marty, for the for the question, I think that there are many perspectives for cooperation. We hope that uh, with the launching of a joint project between the observatory and the European Commission, many of them will be already, um, let's say, scanned at least so we know what exists and where we can cooperate. But your very presence in the in this uh, hub for cooperation, I think, will bring a lot because you could also propose or tell us, uh, as you did last week in the meeting, of course, how we can move on together on this. What is very important is to know that we are very open for this and, and definitely uh, um, consider uh, cooperation with the other organization uh, very important. Deborah, may I just come in also briefly because I think Marty raised a really important conceptual issue. I just wanted to follow up on what Aurora was referring to that I think a better or a wider geographical scope of, of European historical memory initiatives, I think is absolutely important. I mean, especially since what does this geographical imbalance tell us? And the imbalance exists already within the European Union, that it might reflect also fundamentally different understandings of, of history and memory. And I think the Brexit was a very good example for that. And one of the reasons why I think you know the, the Brexit happened was also a fundamentally different interpretation of the role of what Europe is, what European integration project is about. So I think it's important also in, in, a, in a very selfish interest of the Union to widen the scope. And I think the Council of Europe is an obvious target in that sense, that at least you go to those countries that are not yet or no longer both members of the European Union to be also included. But while doing that, we should also not forget that uh, replacing nationalism by Eurocentrism alone is also not the solution. In other words, we should also always keep also the global context in mind. I don't really see a risk for that, but obviously, you know, we also have to keep in mind Europe is also only part of the world, an important one, especially historically, but also simply one part of many, many others. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, anybody else from the from the attendees, from the participants? Uh, any question for our last uh, panel, or in general, also <laughs> or the other? Um, maybe maybe just I have a proposal. Maybe just to break the ice a little bit. We have like basically fifteen minutes that. Um, that should be for conclusions, but I think it might be more 
just to devote these 15 minutes to have like a, a, a conversation and just to uh, also invite Jordi and, and, and Oriol and all the other, just to also to jump in and to react to what has been said, to do uh, just a more lively, because I think maybe, of course, this is extremely interesting. And I'm, I wrote down things for my conclusions that actually more than conclusions are like just invitations to, to further discussion. So then I don't think it's fair that I say those things, you know, and then uh, then it's the end of the, co the conference and it, they cannot, there cannot be a, a reaction. So maybe I'm just going to to say what I wanted to say, both as, as conclusions as and maybe response to 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 Marcos and, and Aurora for for their uh, extremely interesting uh, answer now, and then I would like to maybe to invite uh, the persons I, I mentioned, but also all the other participants to have more like more like maybe spontaneous uh, interventions or like maybe short statements and uh, and again invitations to to continue that in other in other. Uh, settings 